Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jason Walls from QA Cafe. And I'm John Blackford from Eris. Together, we are the co-directors of the Broadband User Services Work Area at the Broadband Forum, and that is the group that has developed and maintained Tier 69 for about 15 years now. We're glad you could join us and have us talk to you about the User Services Platform, or TR369, that was published earlier this year. Uh, USP is kind of the next evolution of Tier 69 that is designed to meet some of the most pressing needs of the connected home now and in the future. Here's what we hope to cover today. The first two points are really the why of USP. We'll examine what got us to where we are now and go over the high level use cases that USP enables that go beyond the design of Tier 69. While we go through these use cases, we'll show you some of the specific parts of the technology that make this possible. I'll also show you some examples of USP messages in our CD router logs so you can get a basic idea of the differences. And then lastly, we'll talk about the testing plan for USP and how to start building or developing requirements for your own implementations. At the end, we will go into questions. Um, some of you gave us some questions ahead of time through our question and air. Um, we are using GoToWebinar for this, uh, and if you've never used it before, you can type your questions in the question box in the lower right-hand corner of your GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get to those questions at the end. Also, if you have trouble seeing some of our examples, you can use the Zoom feature at the top of the GoToWebinar screen uh, to get a closer look. So let's take a trip back in time for a moment. The year was 2004. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg had just launched the original Facebook from his dorm room at university uh, in the US. The Red Sox were on track to break an 86 year championship curse in baseball, which is very dear to me. And the, uh, the UEFA Europe football tournament saw a surprising upset when Greece ended up taking the trophy. But behind all this, service providers everywhere were having a very real problem with broadband gateways, which had already become pretty complex devices and a regular part of their deployments. Onboarding these devices was getting tedious and expensive, mostly relying on truck rolls or user setup via CD-ROMs or UPnP. The, there, was a, there, there was a real need for a standardized system for lifecycle and firmware management, for maintenance, for monitoring, uh, and provisioning new services. And it was back then that the Broadband Forum released the CPE WAN management protocol that you all know and love more commonly as TR69. Uh, I'm going to assume a bit from your responses to the survey we gave that everyone is at least somewhat familiar with Tier 69's architecture. Uh, the key things to point out is that it's made for customer equipment to connect to a single auto configuration server, which is often integrated into OSS and BSS systems. And then underlying Tier 69 is what's known as a data model, uh, which is a description of the objects and their parameters that represent functions on end devices like network interfaces, network applications, and statistics. So over time, TR69 expanded to cover more kinds of devices by adding new features and expanding the data model. Uh, these included set-top boxes and VoIP devices and Wi-Fi access points and a lot more. Then around 2010, the cable industry began using TR69, uh, specifically the device two data model to manage some of their more advanced gateways and Wi-Fi capabilities. Since then, of course, the connected device world has exploded. Uh, the average home has more than just a laptop and a home computer, uh, but tablets, phones, set-top boxes, TVs, smart home devices, all that stuff, all connected through their broadband link and communicating with third-party services. This brings us to why it was time to evolve Tier 69. The connected world now has a much bigger scope, uh, not only in terms of new kinds of devices and interfaces, but virtualized services, uh, third-party interactions, and a real desire for end-user control that creates a seamless connected experience, just as users have now with their mobile connectivity. But it's also a question of scale. Uh, there's now an order of magnitude, or several orders of magnitude, more devices and more connections surrounding the connected user. Um, and consumer electronics that are now network aware are forced to commit to some longer product life cycles uh, that, are, that they're not used to for upgradability. And this explosion really creates a problem where more telemetry is needed, but also 
an opportunity for it to be used to fuel really advanced AI and machine learning applications. And this expansion of scope and scale really means the stakes are bigger too. Uh, I mentioned the upgrade lifecycle and at its heart, this is a security issue. Connected devices really need to be able to patch vulnerable software. Uh, and with, uh, with telemetry in the smart home, there's some serious privacy and data security concerns. And lastly, the question of who owns, uh, who can access, and who is responsible for which connected devices uh, is an ongoing conundrum. So this is the big picture of the components and architecture of USP. Uh, I'm not going to have you stare at it too long right now because it's a lot of stuff. Um, but we're going to keep coming back to this slide. The key thing to, that I want you to keep in mind is this. The user services platform is a network of controllers and agents that manipulate service elements using the robust data model defined in device two to allow for migration and coexistence with TR69. Now, as John goes through several USP use cases, uh, we'll come back to this diagram and sort of point at uh, exactly which of USP's technologies enable those use cases. John? Thank you, Jason. So if we go to the first use case here, we're looking at the uh, explosion of the managed devices inside the house. So the problem being that, you know, between the new Wi-Fi mesh solutions that have been coming out over the last few years, and as well as the, the smart home solutions that keep becoming more prevalent, we're looking at an order of magnitude more devices in the connected home, all of which need to be remotely controlled and maintained. So it's not just you know, the gateway and a few set-top boxes anymore. Uh, we're adding now, you know, a couple of Wi-Fi extenders, you know, maybe a dozen or so smart home devices spread between light bulbs, door locks, cameras, smart TVs, etc. cetera. Um, so instead of managing two or three devices for each subscriber, we're now looking at, you know, 12 to 15, even more uh, per subscriber. Um, so if you multiply that by the number of subscribers that a service provider or an operator has in their network, <clears throat> you're starting to see you know, a, a definite order of magnitude. You know, your, your 10 million deployment uh, before is going to easily uh, turn into 100 million or more uh, devices that are under management. And so when you start looking at that order of magnitude, a lot of, a lot of concerns start to come around network bandwidth. Uh, consumption and usage. Uh, so the solution here is, is you know, first off, first off, having an always-on communication channel helps reduce the number of messages sent across the network. Uh, as we see in TR69 uh, CMP, every time a management entity wants to communicate with a device in the home, it has to establish a communications uh, path, and that that includes you know several messages that happen. But with an always-on communications channel, you know, as the device comes online, that's when the communications path is established. And then after that, each request is sent in its, uh, on its own. It doesn't have to do some kind of pre-work to get the session started. So that definitely saves on the number of messages being sent across the network. And then we also have binary data encoding and relative path usage, which help to reduce the size of the messages that we're sending across the network. So from a binary data perspective, we're looking at a smaller data footprint than, say, an XML, uh, SOAP XML uh, footprint. Uh, that reduces the size there. But we're also, in, in USP, we utilize what we call relative path usage. So that means that if you were to do a get uh, parameter values in tier 69, you would ask for you know, a, a fairly long path and then that path gets repeated in the response for every parameter that comes back. But in USP, we don't continually repeat that path. We, we give the path back once and then everything else is relative to that path. So that cuts down on a lot of characters that are sent across and, and then the size of that message. So the key USP features here are, are the always on communications uh, mechanism as well as the network traffic efficiency. So if we go to the next slide, this is what Jason was kind of talking about, how we're going to come back to this big picture and kind of show for each use case how the big picture uh, ties into that. 
so on the left hand side here we have the always on communications channel. So this is basically in between any of the controllers and the USP agent. We have this pre-built uh, communications channel that gets established when the device comes online such that if a controller wants to send a message or request down to get some information or set, set some information, that that communication channel doesn't have to be established at that point in time. And then on the right-hand side, we see the efficient messages and robust responses. So that's where the protocol, uh, the USP message proto uh, file comes in, which is actually Google, Google protocol buffers. So this allows us to send a binary uh, data encoding across the line. And also, we see the, uh, the different uh, messages up here basically are CRUD-based, you know, kind of REST-oriented uh, uh, messages where you have create, read, update, delete, which are in USP, gets, sets, adds, and deletes. There's a couple other messages we have here to round out what we would need and keep it kind of similar in nature to how Tier 69 did things where we have an operate where we can execute data, data model commands on the device, and then we also have a notify for event processing. All right, so Jason, if we go to the next slide. So the next slide here, we, we have use cases, uh, use case around application-based end user management and control. So the basic problem here is that, um, you know, if it's in the house, we basically, we want an app to manage it. We're becoming a society that is more kind of driven towards our tablets and our smartphones to, to help us control the home network. And so, you know, the Wi-Fi in your home network, you want to you want an app that helps you, you know, figure out what's going on with your Wi-Fi in your home network, how efficient it is, what your speeds are that you're getting, what what devices are connected, and how much data they're using. Uh, as far as your smart home devices, your lights and your door locks and your cameras, you want an app to be able to kind of look at them and see their statuses and, and even control them. And, and the same goes for your TV and your video that you, that you look at. You want to be able to see, you know, your video feed on not only your TV, but your smart devices as well. Um, so we not only want all of those apps, to, but we want them to be very responsive and we want them to display you know, relative, relevant information independent of whatever devices we might be using. Uh, so basically, you know, we want the network to work for us. We don't want to work for the network. So the solution here is that we have, you know, always on communication scan, as we mentioned in the last, uh, the last use case. That helps lead to a more responsive experience because you don't have to wait for that communication session to be, to be nailed up before you, you start asking devices for information. But that's kind of just the first step here. Uh, with USP, we also have a co-app uh, message transfer protocol, uh, which is a UDP-based uh, mechanism that actually has some fairly fast communications uh, that it enables. And so it, it's really good for in-the-home network, uh, and it helps to create a seamless uh, experience uh, when you're using the application because it just provides you, you know, almost instantaneous responses back from the devices. We also want to have, you know, robust and forgiving messaging um, because we're going to have different devices out there. and They're going to have different uh, data models that they support. There's always going to be, you know, extensions that a device implements so that it makes it, you know, a little bit better for, for its environment that it wants to work in. And so we need a way for our messaging between the management endpoint and the device to to actually be forgiving and not and not uh, kind of fail whenever something might you know go wrong. We want to be able to get back as much data as possible and then realize what data isn't available. And so the, some of the key features in here are you know flexible deployments, uh, robust responses, multi-stakeholder architecture. And if we look at the big picture, we'll see how this all ties together. In the uh, multi-stakeholder architecture up on the top left, this is basically talking about how you can actually have multiple controllers. Uh, it's not just the, your operator and your ACS concept anymore. You now can expand into any number of service providers uh, having access to those, uh, 
those devices in the house at any given time. Um, again, on the efficient mes messages and robust responses, that gets into our USP messaging uh, box there on the right-hand side, where we have very forgiving uh, messages uh, that don't fail whenever one thing goes wrong. And then in the bottom right, we have flexible deployment support, which is really talking about how in USP there are multiple message transfer protocols that are available. And each one of them has their own you know, special needs or special usage. Uh, Co-app, for example, is very good when you're doing communications inside the home as it, that is, as it is USP ba uh, UDP based. But Stomp and WebSockets would be something more uh, needed if when the, uh, the smart device, uh, the, the tablet or the, uh, or the phone goes outside of the home and still wants to communicate with the devices inside the home. So on to the next use case, security and privacy. Um, so basically, you know, we kind of live in a new world where security and privacy is very, very important. There's always, you know, someone out there looking to take advantage of any kind of attack vector that might exist into the home network. We've seen it, you know, several times in the past about, you know, the Internet of Things and those devices as they're, you know, usually smaller and easier targets to be attacked because they don't have as much security. So that's definitely one of the things that we're looking to to help close here. We need to be more secure than ever because we need to protect you know, privacy. So we need to provide these tools that help implementations do so. So some of the solutions that we have in place and as part of USP is that you know, you know, we're definitely encrypting the communications channel by TLS and DTLS. Um, that's always the first approach, but we don't stop there. Um, we also have a end-to-end -end security mechanism as part of USP, and this allows us to, to ensure that messages that are being sent between a controller and an agent are protected end-to-end -end because there's a encryption mechanism established between those two endpoints. And so any proxy or man-in-the-middle kind of solution that might be in, the, in, in between those two endpoints isn't going to be able to read that, that communications. Uh, regular firmware upgrades are another uh, big part of what we, we've established in USP, and you know, that helps to close those attack vectors become, before they become a true problem. Um, we also have strict access control. So this ensures that rogue controllers can't reach out can't reach out into a device and, and retrieve data that they're not allowed to access. Um, and it also helps to, to kind of separate the different service providers uh, and, and make sure that they only are accessing the data that they're supposed to access or that, that you've granted them access to as a subscriber. So for example, a, if you have your high-speed internet provider, uh, they're accessing your home network, and their responsibility is to make sure your home network is working. But that's more from a networking perspective, not necessarily, you know, being able to read data off of certain devices. For for example, your home security system may want to be able to read, you know, pull into your camera feeds and you know figure out when do when doors were open and closed. But that's not necessarily something that your high-speed internet service provider should be able to see. So USP does provide you the, the way to put those access controls in place such that one service provider can read data and the other can't. So the USP key features here are the MTP encryption, uh, the end-to-end -end security, and the firmware upgrades and access control. So if we look at it in the big picture here, uh, the top, uh, at the top and the uh, bottom and the, directly in the middle, you'll see the firmware upgrades and the lifecycle management approach here. So this is definitely a two-phase or a two-part uh, solution because you have your controller that's kind of defining what your application uh, policy engine is around firmware upgrades, when to apply them, what devices they need to be pushed to, and at what point in time do they need to be pushed. You know, do they get pushed immediately or do they get more scheduled into a maintenance window? 
but you also have the USP agent side or the device side of the firmware upgrades, which is the one actually responsible for applying that firmware upgrade when it happens. Um, on the left-hand side, you have your privacy and access control mechanisms. This ties very much into your service elements as it's, uh, as it's tied into which portions of the data model uh, need to be uh, given access control to different controllers. On the right hand side, you have your end to end security. This is where the USP record comes in uh, and the optional sessional session context with TLS. Uh, and then at the bottom right, again, the uh, MTP layer encryption where we have TLS or DTLS, depending on which message transfer protocol is being used. So if we go on to the next use case here, we'll uh, talk about mass telemetry. So operators are, you know, they're looking to understand their, the quality of experience that they're providing to their subscribers. It costs more for them to gain a new subscriber than it does to, for them to keep an existing subscriber. So they're constantly looking at how do we improve that quality of experience that we're trying to deliver. And mass telemetry is definitely one of the ways that, that is being embraced recently, you know, being able to collect data from all the devices under management and pull that back in to do some analysis on. So the solution here with USP is, you know, USP is definitely a more uh, efficient protocol than, than previous versions of, of you know, or, or tier 69 and other, and some other management protocols as well. Uh, so that, that does help in the data collection, but we also in USP offer kind of an out of band or a decoupled um, mechanism for data collection that doesn't pollute the, the remote management channel. And it's, it's known as HTTP bulk data collection. So it's basically a way where you can tell the device that this is a set of data that you want to collect. You can tell it how often for it to collect and where to, to actually send that data. And that kind of has a, it creates a side channel, so to speak, uh, such that it doesn't keep uh, that data on the management channel and you can keep that dedicated to just management information. Uh, so once that data has been collected, then the operators have the opportunity to, to analyze that uh, using big data analysis tools and machine learning solutions. So to see how this fits into the big picture, we have uh, again, your multi-stakeholder uh, architecture, so different controllers, each one of those could set up their own uh, mass telemetry solution, whether it be using the, the actual USP messaging or the out-of-band bulk data collection mechanism, um, which leads to kind of the middle arrow there, which is showing how the out-of-band uh, bulk data collection happens, you know, not over the message transfer protocols, but just off to the side. And then on the bottom left, a standardized device two data model. That means that you know, everybody is able to kind of look at the, the concept of what the data is on the device in a similar fashion. And again, on the right hand side, the efficient messaging and robust responses, that's, that's if you want to uh, do your mass telemetry collection over the actual USP messaging. All right, so down to the next use case here, which is a greenfield versus brownfield. So you know, any new solution has to, has to consider both greenfield solutions uh, or greenfield environments where you're dealing with brand new environments as well as brownfield where you're looking at more existing uh, environments with, with specific constraints. And so one of the key design goals of USP was to keep the data model consistent with tier 69 because mapping the data model to underlying libraries and system calls is one of the biggest investments for a CPU when developing a management solution. This, this is why utilizing the device to root data model was of key importance as it allows current CPE to reuse existing uh, investments and speed up their time to market. But all at the same time, utilization of the device to root data model allows for backwards compatibility and that plays into you know, existing ACS vendors and, and 
integrations that they may have and gives them a faster path to adoption. Um, because that, that definitely means that CDMP deployments aren't going to go away and we're not going to be ignoring them. Tier 69 enabled devices are going to be around for you know quite a few years to come still. Uh, so we definitely have to consider you know coexistence between USP and CWMP. Uh, it's, it's a very important concept and it, it, it's going to have to be dealt with. So looking at the big picture here, a little bit different than the previous big pictures because we just want to focus in on the actual communications uh, between the, the controller or ACS and, and uh, the, the device itself. Uh, so at the top left, we see you know your multi-stakeholders, meaning that you can have both a controller and a TR69 communicating uh, to the same device. Um, then you have your standardized device to data model uh, that basically is showing how you know, underneath the uh, covers of the device, you have this mapping between your device to data model and your underlying concepts, libraries, and 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 uh, so forth, and how that just maps into different levels of protocols. Uh, so as you can kind of see, you have both a USP endpoint and a CWP endpoint both coming into your instantiated data model there uh, for their communications. Uh, privacy and access control from a USP's perspective is also going to come in uh, come in hand here, as you may want to have different portions of the data model exposed to USP as as opposed to TR69. And then the last arrow that we're showing here is, is the coexistence with TR69. So it's just kind of showing how both of them can coexist at the same time, both talking to the device. And on that note, I'll turn it over to Jason for uh, the next slide. All right, thanks, John. So let's uh, review all that a little bit and go into a little explanation of the key aspects of USP that enable those use cases. Uh, the first is that the message set uh, or the RPCs, if we're talking if RPCs, if we were talking about tier 69, uh, have been both streamlined and enhanced. Uh, there's mechanisms for performing RESTful operations like creation and deletion uh, or for updating an object through set uh, however, the uh, the managed connected world needs more than just RESTful operations, and so USP has an operate message that allows controllers to call specific synchronous and asynchronous functions. These functions are now defined in the device to data model, uh, like firmware download, which makes for easy expandability later. So we no longer have to make a new version of the entire protocol every time we want to add a new RPC, uh, and the operations can be object specific. Uh, there's also a notify message, which allows for events to be transmitted from an agent to a controller, uh, again, extensible through the data model. Uh, and lastly, the addressing of an object or a parameter in the data model can now be done via uh, search expressions uh, or wildcards. The responses to messages in USP are much more efficient and forgiving. Uh, rather than asking for a set of information and just getting an error, USP will still give you the information you want while telling you which things didn't work. Uh, you can also have the messages that change state, like add, set, and delete. Uh, you can they'll they'll let these su successful changes be made, even if some of the changes fail, uh, if that's what you want to do. Uh, but most important here is the fact that the message footprint and session overhead have been drastically reduced uh, using always-on connections, uh, protocol buffers, and the uh, relative path usage. And I'm just going to cut away really quick to this to show you what this looks like. So we have a CD router log here of a test that was run. Um, and so CD router is actually um, showing you the, 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 the reconstructed message um, rather than the message that's sent on the wire. But this is what a USP message would look like. Um, so you can see the get here from the controller, um, which is just asking for all of the information under uh, device.localagent.controller, uh, just like a, a partial path in TR69. And then you see the response. Uh, you can see the, uh, the USP record here. And then the response shows you the resolved path um, and then the parameters underneath. You can see that it's just giving you the, the parameters 
rather than spelling out the entire path of each one. Um, but I want to show you the difference between, so again, this is, this is the reconstructed message on the wire. If we go over to an actual USB capture on CloudShark, on the wire, you'll see, uh, if we follow stream here, you'll see the actual, this is the binary encoded data, which is much smaller <laughs> than you would see if you were to do this with tier 69 or some, or, e or even if you were doing it with, with JSON data. It's significantly smaller on the wire. Uh, so I want to also talk about the transport bindings because this design is a big departure from almost any other protocol that's out there. Uh, tier 6.9, as you know, is heavily bound to HTTP. So even building the XMPP connection, uh, connection request mechanism uh, had to be done out of band. Um, in USP, the lines between protocol and transport, uh, which we call message transfer protocols um, or MTPs to not confuse it with the actual OSI transport, uh, is, is th that line is very clearly defined. Uh, and this, this not only allows for future expansion, but it also ensures that the protocol will operate the same way regardless of the use case, whether it's uh, traditional management uh, or control points that are moving across networks or, uh, or when you're using USP on constrained devices. Uh, USP's method for defining and delivering events via the notify message is also a unique feature. Uh, there are core events built into the notify message, but beyond that, the events can be defined in the device2 data model, allowing for object-specific notifications that are easily ext uh, extensible. Uh, controllers, this works by controllers subscribing to a certain notification by using the add message to create an instance of a subscription object. Uh, and there's references to the objects and parameters that are the subject of the notification. Uh, and that can even be a search expression uh, to cover multiple objects. And the last but maybe most important feature, like John was talking about, uh, is the security and access control. Uh, the USP record layer allows for an optional session context, uh, which can be served, secured via, via TLS. And that's at the application layer, which means it's secured from end to end. This is important because internetworking requires crossing certain points that can be a single point of failure uh, for men in the middle or other attacks. And uh, secondly, the, the multi-controller architecture is secured and privacy is enabled by that role-based access control we were talking about. Uh, that is only certain controllers can see or do certain things. And that access control is actually easily managed via the data model. All right, so where is US is USP now and uh, where is it headed? Uh, for, for testing, QA Cafe has already developed test suites and automation for USP that are based on the current PlugFest test plans, as well as the initial set of broadband form conformance tests. Um, this includes support for implementations uh, using any of the message transfer protocols. So we'll support uh, any device that's implementing USP using Stomp or WebSockets or CoAP. Um, John, do you want to talk about uh, ECO and the plan for testing going forward? Yeah, sure. Um, from the Aeros side, we've uh, we've created both a USP controller and the USP agent. Uh, the USP controller is called Eco Control, and our USP agent is called Eco Envoy. Uh, both of these components are part of our Eco software, uh, our software suite called Eco Service Management. Um, from an Eco Envoy perspective, that's the one we kind of use for testing with the CD router USP testing module. Uh, so, you know, that helped validate uh, the testing of the CD router module. It also helped validate the uh, Eco Envoy implementation. Um, being so early to market with, I mean, USP is what, six months since it's been published. So being so early to market, there's not a whole lot of uh, deployments out there to validate against. So testing with or against the CD router uh, definitely helped our, our implementation. And, and it also helped the, the USP specification testing uh, because we've, you know, as we tested, we came out uh, and found several kind of small issues uh, that we've been targeting in broadband form as, as core genome fixes to, to the USP specification. So if we go to, you know, where's, what other testing is, is, is happening and, and what other uh, items are happening around interop and compliance. Uh, so we've already had two plug fests to date. Uh, 
which are plug tests or group testing events uh, with multiple participants, you know, on both sides, both the controllers and the agents, where we all just get together and we we test against each other uh, to see how how interoperable we are. Uh, so we, in the two plug fests, both Eris and QA Cafe have been involved in that, as have a numer number of other uh, uh, vendors. Uh, the next plug fest is being planned for April uh, of next year. Uh, your participation is welcome. If you've you know, got a deployment that you want to, or sorry, an implementation that you want to try to test interoperability with other people, that, that's where we do it. Uh, the Broadband Forum is also developing a certification test plan that will look at conformance, interoperability, and functional testing. And the Broadband Forum is also looking at a, a certificate, certification program for, for around USP. And so we'll have more details uh, about, those tests, about that test plan and that program in the first half of 2019. Okay. Uh, all right. So what do you do if you want to start implementing USP? Uh, the full specification uh, defined in Broadband Forum TR369 is actually published on the web at usp.technology. And I'll actually go there right now and show you what that looks like. It's at this website right here. And if you click on specification, uh, you will find the, uh, the definitions for architecture, discovery, messages, uh, the, the entire protocol. And if you do want a PDF version of it, you can find it here too. And then the US data model the, the, the USP uh, data model is actually generated from the same base as the tier 69 device two data model uh, with some changes for operations, uh, events, and the objects that are specific to USP. But you can find that on the web here at uh, USP data models uh, at broadband, uh, broadbandform.org. And uh, I'll take a look at some of these. This is laid out just like the CDMP one is. So you can scroll down here. Uh, you can find the most recent version. So support for USP is it's the first, the earliest version of device two that supports USP is device 2.12. And it's as familiar as you imagine. Um, that shows all of the objects and interfaces and everything that you need. And I'm going to jump over here to show you a USP specific one. Uh, so this is device.local agent. Local agent is a USP specific object and the subscription object which is used to uh, to have the controller subscribe to certain notifications and events, um, and so all of the uh, sort of the the normative requirements for how that's supposed to work is all within the object and within the parameters. So if you're looking to deploy to uh, implement that, then you want to go here. Um, the other thing to look at is the uh, the protocol buffers schema definitions. So you can find those uh, in, in the spec if you go to the encoding, the, the, uh, the page about encoding, um, but you can also find them directly on GitHub um, at this link right here. So the protocol buffers are basically a, uh, it's a, they're schemas. So that allows both endpoints to understand and communicate with each other with a very small amount of overhead and some really easy coding steps. And then lastly, uh, automating the testing of your implementations is obviously going to be uh, critical to doing it right. So for very good reasons, you know, for very, some very good reasons, USP is pretty complex. Um, some of you on the call already have the CD router test platform. Uh, and for you, it's as simple as getting hold of the USP add-on for CD router. Um, and those of you new to CD router, uh, we'd love to follow up with you on how you could be uh, cutting the time and resources uh, for de development and deployment of any connected device uh, by tenfold. So that was a lot of information since it is a pretty dense topic. Uh, we'll be making this webinar available uh, as a video online and which we'll send out to everybody after. Uh, but now we'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, you can type your questions into the uh, question box in the lower right hand corner of your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and we'll try to address them as we come. We do have a few uh, questions uh, from, like I said, from the survey before. So let's get to those. And there is a question about migration and for which uh, which types of products are going to be supported. Um, any, we, we've expanded the, so because it's using the device two data model, we've also expanded the, uh, the service data models to support USP2. 
as well. Um, so if you know if you're building a set-top box or if you're building a VoIP device, um, you, you'll be able to implement uh, the service data models uh, using USP as well. Ah, this is a good one. Okay, so what's the difference between the USP record and the USP message? Uh, the reason why there's two layers to that um, is for a, a couple of reasons. One was uh, decisions we were making about what parts of the header should be encrypted um, and what was the minimum set of information that, uh, you know, that something that was maybe acting as a proxy needed to know. Um, so that's that's why the that stuff was sort of ripped out and put into the USP record. But the other reason the record exists is to provide that end-to-end -end, um, communications channel. Uh, so if you end up wanting to have that end-to-end -end security that is locked down at the application layer, um, the USP records are the mechanism by which they do that. And the USP message is what actually contains the uh, the RPC that is uh, that is trying to be activated. So the difference would be is like the the USP record says, you know, who is this from and who is it going to, and this is how it's secured, and this is what you need to know in order to understand the message. And then the message contains the actual RPC. Uh, okay, so here's a really good question: Is USP designed to run on IoT devices themselves? Uh, yes. No, it really depends on, I mean, there are some IoT devices out there that are still going to be way too lightweight, uh, even for USP. Um, but it really is designed, uh, it, it really can easily enable something like a, uh, something like a, a smart hub, right? Um, and we have a kind of a more advanced proxy mechanism, which we didn't go into here, uh, more advanced than, than it is in TR69, that allows you to sort of replicate um, the device to data model um, under a tree that helps you describe other devices that are attached um, that might be running over different protocols. Um, so yeah, that, that in your in your question, you're specifically asking about that proxy. A absolutely. So there's um, this proxy device table right here. Um, US, the, the USP data model has sort of changed the data model schema a little bit to introduce the idea of a mount point. So what you can actually do with the proxy device table is, uh, is, is use the same objects and parameters that you could from the, from the device to data model to represent devices that might not be, uh, that, they, that aren't exactly on the same device that the agent is on. Uh, but in addition to that, um, there's also uh, plans in place for an, a message transfer protocol proxy. So like if you have something that can handle USP that, but it's only talking co-app, um, they would, there's a project in place at the broadband forum now to, for an, an, a message transfer protocol proxy such that that device can talk to the gateway. Uh, and then the gateway will translate it into another message transfer protocol and send the message on. Yeah. And Jason, that kind of, that kind of also leads into what we're going to be showing at Broadband World Forum next week, where we have, uh, we have a, a green wave there uh, with their gateway that has a Zigbee embedded uh, controller inside of it and a, a Zigbee light bulb. And it's going to be talking to the ARIS uh, controller, USP controller, uh, to do manipulation of that light bulb return status turn it on and off, uh, all that information is actually being driven through the proxy device uh, uh, table that, that Jason's showing here. Uh, does USP allow the agent to be managed by one controller and data collect to another controller? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that is kind of a, a fundamental part of that use case, and it's based on the, the permission schemes. Uh, and even if you're going to be using the out-of-band uh, mechanism, um, the permission scheme will, will lock that down. Ah, okay. That, I, I, I'm glad that somebody asked this. Um, in, the, in the architecture, it looks like we're saying that you are going to have two TLS tunnels nested. That's not necessarily the case. The design we have, the reason why this session contact is optional, um, in the specification, we require that you use at least one of these things. So if you know, if you're satisfied with things being secured at the message transport layer, um, over TLS or DTLS, then that's fine. Um, it's also the, the session context is for if you don't have that or if you really are trying to lock stuff down because you know something's going through a secondary system or a proxy.
So it's, it is, it is a little confusing. It looks like you're supposed to always use both, but, uh, but no, you, you, you just need to use at least one of these. Uh, and yes, um, we do envision CDM, uh, uh, USP and CDMP coexisting on the same device. Uh, that was, uh, I think, this use case here. Um, it's so, for example, you know, there's a lot of people who are building sort of third-party managed Wi-Fi solutions, right? So if you if you're managing uh, you're managing other stuff in the gateway via tier 69, and you have another service uh, that you want to use USP to manage Wi-Fi or some other aspect, then then you absolutely can do that. And again, the, the permission scheme is what uh, helps handle all that. There was a question about uh, behind, you know, doing stuff from behind the net or the firewall. And, you know, that is kind of really why uh, you can't just jump on a straight up rest situation when it comes to managing these kinds of things. And it's also the reason why we um, had this whole th uh, three, different, um, three different MTPs, right? Um, so stomp is a message transfer protocol uh, and it's, it's, sorry, it's a, uh, it's like a message broker based protocol, a lot like MQTT, um, where it's connecting or, or like XMPP where it's connecting to an, a, a chat server to enable the, uh, the controller, uh, and the agent to talk to each other, uh, across network boundaries and across firewalls and across uh, network address translation. Oh, I do have one more question here that we'll do. Um, can you combine different MP NTPs for different functionalities? Uh, I don't remember. John, you might want to take that one. So the question is if we can use CoAP for telemetry and WebSockets for management. Uh, I don't remember what we said about having one agent using two different MTPs. Do you remember what we... Yeah, yeah. An agent can certainly use multiple MTPs. Uh, you know, I, I could definitely see uh, an agent using CoAP uh, inside the house for controllers that are subscriber controlled. Uh, so, you know, on tablets or, or smartphones, while also supporting either a WebSocket or a Stomp MTP for communications to, you know, external service providers. So, yeah, I definitely would be able to have multiple MTPs there. 